Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about probing. Um, we have uh, several people that work in, in probing. Um, they have, uh, there's a whole group that's devoted to probing um, because it doesn't do you any good to have highfalutin performance here if you can't get that highfalutin performance off the board and into the scope. Um, one of the hardest things to do is to figure out how to probe that signal without disturbing it too much um, and also maintaining its performance all the way through a system that a human can hold, a human can solder, um, a human needs to get to from the scope to the to the, the uh, PC board. And so there's a number of probe technologies that kind of up that game in order um, to give you more bandwidth and more signal fidelity getting to getting from the board to the scope. Um, considerations for picking a probe. Um, one, obviously, the number one of the number ones is signal bandwidth. Um, another one would be the source impedance. Um, what is the impedance I'm trying to probe? If I'm trying to probe 25 ohms, um, you know, it 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 doesn't do me any good if I put a probe that's 10 ohms there. Um, ultimately, if 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 that probe is 10 ohms, then that's going to load a, a huge factor. If I'm probing um, something that's a mega ohm node. It doesn't really do me any good to put a 50 ohm uh, uh, um, input impedance probe on there because that's loading that mega ohm down to the point where you're not going to get any signal into the probe. So what you're trying to probe is one of the fundamental things to you know in selecting what kind of probe you're going to use. The signal size, you know, some of our probes that are designed to, to measure you know multi gigahertz, they really can't accept very very large signals. Um, whereas a a mega ohm or ten mega ohm passive probe, you can put quite a bit of voltage on those guys before you destroy it, but you're not going to get the bandwidth through the probe. Um, Single-ended and differential measurements, you know, a lot of the signaling is done at very high speeds is differential. This guy goes up, there's two traces, one goes up and one goes down, um, and, and the information is carried between those two. So it doesn't, it, it's, it's harder to just probe one of them if you really want to see what the, what's going on on the other one. So this particular probe right here is basically can measure both of those simultaneously and then um, send those you know, convert them from differential to single and then send it into the single and an input of the scope. Um, probe output impedance is another one. What are we driving? Are we driving the 50 ohm input or are we driving the one mega ohm input? If we're driving the 50 ohm input, we need a low output impedance on the probe. If we're driving the one mega ohm input, um, we can have a lot larger output impedance on that probe. Um, and then, of course, cost. And then, you know, ruggedness, all those things play into it. So one of the, 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 the first type of probe that you, you might come across or the, and the cheapest one is used for, for, um, driving the one mega, one mega ohm input. Um, these are called high impedance passive probes. They're more rugged. They're pretty cheap. Um, they handle larger vol voltages and they have the highest input resistance to probe the highest resistances on a board. Um, the cons obviously are lower bandwidth. Um, we can't get, more than about 500 megahertz through that guy, and they have a lot heavier capacitive loading, which does contribute to the lower bandwidth too. The next set um, that we came up with was a uh, low impedance resistor divider probe. Um, th these are good to maybe two gigahertz or so. Um, they have lower capacitive loading than a high Z probe does. They're cheaper than an active probe, um, but they do have lower input resistance than this guy does. You know, this guy might be 10 meg ohms input. This one might be a K ohm or so. So that does limit the, um, the, the, the amount of impedance that you can probe. Um, and the scope, because it's a 50 ohm system, the scope needs to have a 50 ohm input. Um, if it doesn't, then it's output impedance, um, well, it doesn't necessarily have to have a 50 ohm put, but the the uh, what goes on between that cable and the and the one mega ohm at the input is that there's a big discontinuity there, and you, and it affects the signal integrity. So you'd really want to drive into a 50 ohm input. And then the the next class, which is where most of um, Mike and Ned and the probes team focus a lot of their energy, are are um, highest performance differential active probes that we have. Um, you know, the, the highest one we have now goes up to about 30 gigahertz, um, really low capacitive lower loading. Um, it does have higher input impedance than the divider probe and um, lower capacitance, I believe. Um, and then it's good for both differential and single-ended measurements. You have the, the ability, you could maybe put one of these on ground and then one on the signal to measure, you know, uh, single-ended signals, or you could put them across uh, a, a input um, to measure the differential signals. 
And we even have one now that, that can take and, and, and um, depending on how you process the signals in the probe, you can do single-ended or differential or make a common mode measurement. You can, you can do, instead of this minus that, <coughs> excuse me, for, um, for differential signals, you can do this plus this inside the amp for common mode signals. And you can do that with a, an electronically switched uh, chip here that you don't need to change your probing configuration. So if you're going to go to the time to actually get these things soldered in and all that, it's really nice to be able to switch between the measurement classes without having to re-solder in the, the, uh, the leads. Um, so what's inside these guys? Um, if this is the DUT that we're trying to measure, there's some signal we're trying to measure and it's got some output impedance. Basically, whatever probe we hook onto that is going to affect the signal we're trying to measure. So if this is really large, we want this resistance here to look large. Um, in other words, so we don't get a lot of voltage division across there. The problem with it is that, you know, this type of topology does have a, a significant amount of capacitance. So, you know, this is the, the high Z in, um, passive probe that we have. And, you know, it's got like, I think it's a rated bandwidth of about 500 megahertz or so. That's when we're probing a THEV of about uh, 25 ohms. If this voltage or if this impedance goes up, that capacitance, you know, is in parallel with that ultimately. And it's going to bring down the bandwidth cap capability that we can measure based on how big that capacitor or how big this uh, source resistance is. So, you know, don't think just because you grab a 500 megahertz probe, you're going to be able to measure 500 megahertz on, on, on anything you measure. It really depends. You know, you've got to kind of think about what you're trying to probe and what the loading is of that. Um, um, the next one is that one I talked about. It's a resistive divider probe. Um, this guy basically has a 450 or 950 ohm resistor, and then that works with the 50 ohms of the scope to give you a resistive divider here. If it's 450, it's a 10 to 1 divider to the scope. If it's 950, it's a 21 divider. Why would you want to use one over the other? Obviously, you want more signal maybe, but um, maybe what you're trying to measure has a Thevenin resistance, you don't want to load down as much. So you might pick 950 ohms at the expense of the divider. Um, again, it has lower capacitive loading, but you still have to kind of, you know, think about what you're trying to measure before you hook this thing up and figure out what it's doing to your signal. Um, differential active probes, there's actually a, um, an IC inside a probe body. This, this, this um, particular circuit is, um, I think, I don't know if it's this exact one, I don't think it is, but there's something like this in this little probe body here. So um, this thing connects to the scope and going down this thing, there's um, DC lines, control lines and everything to actually um, bias up the amplifier that's in there. And then um, ultimately then that guy has two inputs that these little um, different um, uh, accessories plug into to make, you know, to give you different types of performance. You know, the longest accessories um, and depending on the probe tip, they might be better for, you know, more all around probing at these frequencies, but they don't give you quite the bandwidth of some of the finer accessories. So there's a, I mean, we have uh, numerous accessories to, to allow you to probe various things. And a part of what uh, Mike and his team do is they educate customers on what accessory you actually need to probe. And these are very sophisticated customers that still kind of need to be educated because, you know, we spend more time thinking about this than they do on what ultimately is the best set of accessories to probe the signals that they want to measure. Um, basically, the way this thing works is, you know, it's a, it's a, um, a tip resistor that might be large t together with a capacitance here and that forms a what we call a, a tip zero so at high frequencies you let more signal in and then on the other side of this guy there's a load that has a resistor and a capacitor in series with it the multiple the the, the resistance times the capacitance here is equal to the resistance times the capacitance there and um, what that will give you is a very flat response versus frequency um, so it allows us to do, you know, do probing, you know, up into the tens, couple tens of gigahertz range. Um, and then various types of accessories. I think I have a picture of some of the other things, you know, depending. And this is a, this is one that looks kind of like this one, but this one has a, something you can actually hold and browse around. I think this one's not rated quite for the bandwidth of some of these others, but it does give you the convenience to be able to kind of probe around and see very fast signals in something that you can actually hold in your hand. And then there's some things here, these little, these little breakaway components that you can either solder down onto your board and then plug in this probe head too, um, 
uh, to get more or you know better performance. And then we have we have some other applications that if you don't want to um, um, probe something, you know, with the with that input network, if you're probing like a coax, if there's like a, your your test board has coaxial cables coming out or whatever, you can plug something in. You can you can. Uh, um, screw this guy onto that and then ultimately you're in a coaxial environment so you can still have the functionality of some of the probe functions but now you're not um, soldering something down onto the board so that's pretty much all i had um, there's obviously numerous places you can go to to learn more about all this stuff um, you know we have keysight.com there's app notes and data sheets you could probably spend the rest of your life reading those um, there's this thing called the oscilloscope blog that we have and uh, I'd forgotten to put the um, the uh, YouTube channel on there now. I'll add that to this guy. So that concludes what I had to say. Um, were there any questions? Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with the input protection with ESP? Yeah, that's a good question. So ultimately, um, you have to put enough protection on there so the thing is somewhat robust, but not so much that it causes... Um, a lot of capacitive loading. So, you know, ultimately, if you're going to, the larger, the more energy that you're going to try to, to protect against, that usually involves bigger structures, bigger diodes, you know, if they're ESD diodes across your front end, and then you're going to take a capacitive penalty for that. Now, we do do things um, where we try to compensate out that some of that capacitance by judicious placement of inductances, for, for instance, between them. So, like, I've had a capacitance here, and I have two inductors, um, that looks almost like you can configure the L um, of the inductors you put there with the capacitance to kind of make it look like the square root of L over C almost looks like 50 ohms. Um, it, now, it's a lumped approach, so it has a limited bandwidth. But um, ultimately, that's the kind of things that we do. So like on that, um, on the 8 gigahertz preamp, I could go back if I could find it. Um, yeah, there it was. See this little... This little spirally thingy here, that's actually a little spiral inductor on the chip. And that's used to compensate out, like I told you, the, um, the input capacitance of the amplifier, because there's capacitance there too, and also the capacitance of the little ESD diodes that are there. Now then, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll do some off-chip compensation too, um, or ESD protection. There might be limiting circuits here. Well, sometimes we use a thing called a spark gap, which is basically a two traces close close together that if the signal gets large enough, it will break down the dielectric in between them, and a lot of that energy will go across that spark gap and not get into the amp, um, stuff like that. I think um, we've used that in probes before. Um, I don't know if there's one on the front end of Storm. Um, Ryan, do we, we don't have spark gaps on that one, do we? No. Yeah, there's a limiter, though, for the 50 ohms, yeah. Um, and that limiter... One of its functions is to protect that solid state attenuator in the 50 ohm path. So the limiter is basically the first thing that is behind the BNC. I didn't have that on the diagram, but that basically protects the, the attenuator first and then secondarily the front end of the amp. But I think, I think if something's going to get damaged, it's probably the attenuator in this particular guy first. Yep. Anything else? Well, the net net of it is the higher the bandwidth, the more likely you are to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that wrist wrap's important. Uh, um, yeah, and then ultimately, you know, the, you know, if you're going to pay hundred or tens of thousands of dollars for an instrument, you do have to be aware that, you know, it can be damaged if you're reckless in handling it. Yeah. Yeah, Bear. Do you guys measure the signal coming in to determine how much attenuation is switching? Um, well, the, one of the ways to, to determine it is if the signal is too big, it's going to be clipped on the screen. So, you know, if you, if you, if you basically see it's clipped and you don't want it, you know, then you'll change the volts per division. But, um, in that, in that auto scale function, one of the things it does is it measures the ADC codes that it's acquiring. And if it does, I, um, I'm speculating here because I didn't design the auto scale function, obviously. But if it sees that the ADC is clipped, it will, one of the things it will do is reduce, or, you know, it will go in and change the, the, the front end hardware to put in more, more attenuation to get that, get that thing centered on screen better. Yeah. Yeah, over voltage will detect it too. Over voltage is meant more as, as part of our protection strategy. You know, if you have very slow, like maybe somebody puts their probe down on a 10 volt signal or a 10 volt DC, um, 
that one, um, it's, it's, it's something that's not moving because our overvoltage has a limited bandwidth. But ultimately, hopefully before it does much damage in heating up our termination resistor or things like that, it will, it will send a flag. There's actually overvoltage uh, circuitry on here to detect that coming into this guy. And then that sends a flag to the CPU system to basically go and throw that um, pass select relay. So what it does is it throws the relay to the high impedance side. So if you ever... If you're ever probing something and you start moving voltages up, you know, like say you're probing DC and you're, or a power supply and you move the power supply voltages up, at some point you'll hear a relay click and on the screen it'll say over voltage limit reached. Um, check your system or whatever, you know, and that's part of our protection strategy too. Yeah. Anything else? Yep. Can you talk a little bit about calibration and, and how, you know, is that mostly software based or? Yeah, so I'm not an expert on calibration, but I can um, talk about a little. Let's go to a block diagram. So one of the things that calibration has to do, it, well, what calibration is used for is figuring out, you know, we get, a, we get a chip, for instance. You know, nominally, if I click in a gain of two, I'd like to have a gain of two. Um, but because of process variation, you know, variation in the attenuator, it might not be a gain of two. So that's one of the simpler calibrations to think about in terms of how do we get the gain of this to be what we think it is or what we want it to be um, given variations in the process. And that's where calibration comes in. So one of the things that we will do is we will send um, from a resource on the, on the board or whatever, we will hook in a DC signal here that we, for instance, will ramp, you know, so it's basically one of the ways that we do it is um, I mentioned that uh, that uh, offset DAC, the voltage DAC. That's a DAC that, of course, that has to be calibrated, too. <laughs> but once it's calibrated um, and I'm not really sure about the chicken or the egg thing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you'll have to ask somebody who's been more of an expert in that in, in, in uh, writing those routines and everything. But um, once that thing is calibrated, we can configure that to put out a ramp. Um, and if we know what we're putting out into the front end and the ADC is used to ultimately measure that, then we can go in and fine tune what the gain, gain coefficients are in here. And that's another thing that that gain vernier is used for, you know, the continuously variable gain. You can set that to, to, um, have an offset or whatever, an offset and gain to scale against the errors in the step gain, for instance. Um, but yeah, basically it's a, it's kind of a, you need to have observability and you need to have a way to stimulate the, with, with, uh, stimulate the circuit with something that's known. And once you have that, then there's a whole bunch of code, you know. I mean, it takes several months a lot of times or, you know, to get a really sophisticated scopes to get that first cow to, to ultimately work. And there's all kinds of cows. There's, timing cows, there's trigger cows, there's interleave cows for high performance stuff, you know, so I don't claim to know how all that stuff works, but in general, it's providing known things um, that you can measure and then figure out what the error in your measurement are and then coming up with um, coefficients to minimize that error. Yeah. 